We're live. What is up, calf friends? Welcome to episode 15 of the Caffeine's Cast. Today we're joined by none other than Mr. Frost himself, Iceman 1H. Hey guys. Welcome. Welcome, sir. I like the calf friends. That's a, that's the, that's a that's nice the, term. Thank you. Right? It's, a, it's, it's, a it's better than pod fiends. Pod fiends is what I was running with for <laughs> a, a while. I mean, yeah. both have a good ring to it, but the calf fringe just sounds a little bit more inviting. All right. It's just, yeah. you know, we're coming right. in. So, uh, and as always, we've got our caffeine with us. Uh, I've got some cold brew. Cold brew. Will's got the cold brew. Iceman. Show. I, got a, I got a beer. He's got a brew. Show, yeah. show, show him that beer. can, there, There's though. caffeine in here, right? Show him that can, dude. Yeah, look at if that. If it's dank, you thing. know it's got it's all three. The dank meme can. Honestly, it doesn't get any better it. than that. Honestly, love it. It tastes even better than it looks. Super good. <laughs> it looks pretty great, too. <laughs> yeah. That's always what you want. So right. as always, our host, Will, we're going to let you kick it off, get us started on the convos for today. What do we got going on? Oh, man. It's great to be here. Welcome to episode 15. We've made it, uh, you know, over the Ooh. the two. Like, if you were to listen to a podcast of ours once a day, we are now into week three. But uh, we're... Wow. We're hitting these these benchmarks, man. Um, today, we're just really happy to have friend of the clan, uh, Iceman. Uh, we're going to talk about PvP, Destiny, the future of it. Um, Ice, you're, like I said, a very close uh, friend of the Caffeine's clan. We have a, a, a storied history of uh, our members hanging with you on your stream, twitch.tv slash Iceman underscore 1H, right? Yep, got it. Yep. Got it. Nailed it. 1H. Um, but how would you describe yourself to our listeners as a streamer and a content creator? It's actually, first, it's kind of wild how long we've known each other now. Like, all you guys yeah. in the Caffeines are awesome people. Like, Thank every you. single person that I met are awesome. So, Andy, guys are doing a, a great cool. thing with the podcast and all the things you're doing with Caffeine. So, super impressive. Oh, thanks, man. Um, but um, how would I describe myself as a content creator? Um, I mainly do FPS RPG style games. Um, I've been a gamer since as long as I can remember. Um, apparently I beat Super Mario Brothers three when I was three years old. My dad told me. Wow. Um, so Impressive. I've been a gamer ever since got into final fantasy, um, played all kinds of RPG games because of final fantasy. Um, and then found Counter-Strike, and I, well, I know we're going to talk about all that down the line, but found Counter-Strike, and that got me into FPS games, along with, like, GoldenEye, um, all kinds of different RPS, uh, FPS games. Um, and I've kind of, now that I think about my gaming history, I've always kind of stayed in games that have that, that uh, FPS slash RPG um, air about them. Um, okay. And that's I, why I think I, I enjoy Destiny and all those types of games so much. So as a content creator, I try to be educational, um, try to be as entertaining as possible, try to play whatever game I'm playing at as high a level as possible, especially if it's an FPS game. Um, but I try to have fun, um, make it an inviting community, a loving community, people that want to hang out with each other, help each other game together, um, while trying to teach people as much as I can at the same time. So, hell yeah, you absolutely do that. I've uh, bared witness to literally an insane depth of uh, of uh, knowledge for PvP games, which we definitely want to definitely want to pick your brain on um, a little bit later in the podcast. But that is, yeah, absolutely. dude, beating beating Mario three at three. The best that I could <laughs> the best that I could match with that is uh, when I was five, I got Sonic the Hedgehog. And Ooh. my dad and I thought Robotnik was going to give us a ride to the next level. And then we discovered that we were hurting him. That's that's where my brain is. <laughs> uh, we were like, maybe he's going to take us. Maybe we're going to go somewhere. You know, that's so awesome. That's, uh, that's no, that's, great, that's it's great that you're able to do that and figure that out. But yeah, that was on the Genesis, right? Original Sega Genesis, Sega Genesis, man. Uh, 16 bit uh, fond, fond memories of that one. Yeah, that's a good system. I had Sega CD as well, which was underrated. Sega Super CD. good. Sega CD was insane. I still have mine. I have, I have the Sega CD with the, with the wide body Genesis and then the 32 X mm -hmm. that like sits on top of it. It feels like a transformer. Yeah, it, you like, could, you could bench like, press harder. that thing really. If you, you want to work out. <laughs> you could. Absolutely. You can get some reps. Dude. Um, but yeah, the thing was, uh, that thing was insane. I a hundred percent hear you on the, uh, the RPG elements kind of coming together. Uh, between games and in the fps genre I, honestly 
never really stuck to me that like that is kind of the two worlds that really emerged. Like you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, of course, Destiny is an MMO and stuff like that. But I always sort of like put it in its own bracket. But uh, it's, it's yeah. that's a great uh, a thought on that. For uh, really, if it comes down to things that require a lot of thought, strategy, tactics, um, that kind of thing, I I love it. And so our RTS games kind of took control for a little while as well when it was. Um, like StarCraft, StarCraft 2, especially when that came out, uh, was huge for me. Um, and then WarCraft 3. Nice. Buddies and I played WarCraft 3 like crazy when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, StarCraft 100%. was the uh, sort of reason why I have a job to this day. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. Have I told this story on the podcast, Perk? No. You should All do right. it because I'm going to tell them the cave story. So go you for pro- it. You probably will. So, like, back in the day, you know, uh, I was hella into taekwondo um i was on on track to try out for the olympic team i was traveling all over the country um like competing and then one summer the summer of 2009 i moved to korea for the summer and i was training and competing uh at uh something called the world taekwondo expo and um the moment i landed in seoul it was just me my like my master and his son we were like, cool, let's go to a cyber cafe. And we start playing Brood War. And I'm like, this is amazing. Uh, place third in the world from a weight class and belt at the time. Hell yeah. Come back to the States. Stop training immediately. Only play Brood War until the beta releases. That's uh, like the next summer. Uh, get fat. Uh, devote 100% of my time to StarCraft II. Um, and then I was like, all right. So my career path for Taekwondo is gone. Let's make StarCraft my career path. And then I just sort of like brute force my way into MLG with the internship. And now I'm here. That's awesome, man. Do you think you would have gotten first if you didn't discover Brood War? In no, that no. I was, um, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I was heavily outclassed, um, got the shit kicked out of me. Um, the f- funny story about that was the day after the competition, we were staying with this, um, this, guy this master who taught it in long island somewhere super hardcore dude and jumped he like jumped into like our dorm rooms we were staying at like some abandoned college basically and it's like hey everyone uh you're gonna wake up at 4 a.m we're gonna get on a bus and climb a mountain and we're like oh that's funny that's great that's that's a great joke <laughs> tournament's <laughs> over uh-huh. dude that's fine and he's like no so we wake up he comes in with like banging like a spoon on a, a pan. We hop on this bus. We go. It was in a, a city called Jonju, which is like a, normally during the winter, it's like a ski resort town. But given that it was the summer, no snow, we end up running up this fucking ski mountain, and there's like <laughs> wild oh, boars. No. Like literally, he's like making a scream, kia, like uh, like on like intervals. And one time we're like we scream, and this fucking mother boar and her baby just run right across our path, and we're just like. Uh oh, we gotta fucking run, and then we just bolt up the mountain. We're like, how do we get home? And uh, you know, we did. But uh, that is wow. insane. I've never, I've definitely not heard that one because I remember you screaming "kia," running up a mountain, screaming at wild boars. Yeah, that's uh, uh holy shit. That's the that will sounds, produces that origin story. Kind of traumatizing. I'm not gonna lie, but getting yeah, well, third in the world, was. third in the world, that's, that's great. Pretty badass. Well Still done. Have the medals. Yeah. Um, in my parents' place somewhere. But we're here to and talk this- about you. Yes. We're here to talk about ice. We'll, we'll do an, we'll do a will podcast. I'm literally accessible all the time. We only have you for this episode. And if you would decide to come back, we can. We'll always. Oh, love I would to love have to you. come back. You know. That. Um, but uh, let's talk about growing up and competition. So, yeah. um, was your first competitive game Counter Strike? Like, how, what was the first tournament you remember getting into? It was Counter Strike. Um, I was always like a. I just loved gaming. I was always like a kind of a single player gamer. Except for like Goldeneye, I'd play with friends all the time. We'd stay up until like four or five in the morning just playing Goldeneye. Um, So that might have been like the true competitive start. Um, But like actual tournaments, actually getting into a competitive type team um, was Counter-Strike. I started Counter-Strike Beta 6 like way, way back when Counter-Strike was really first starting. Mm -hmm. Um, And... <clears throat> really got into it at about 1.3 from a competitive environment. Um, joined my first clan, started meeting people, found IRC. I don't know if people even oh. remember IRC now, yeah. but IRC was IRC is a really, really dark, gross place 
if you really really got in there it was disgusting it is a menagerie for sure yeah a lot of good um, and a lot of bad yes so we used irc um there are all kinds of different clubs clan channels all kinds of community channels stuff like that um but that really got me into the tournament scene and then once 1.6 hit the tournament stuff really took off um there was all kinds of like uh cpl was a huge thing at the time wcg the world's um cyber games or something like that i can't remember anymore i vaguely remember that yeah. um beyond but, the game yeah, the cyber yeah exactly. games fucking exactly uh, theme song so yeah that was we started playing satellite tournaments um all kinds of stuff getting into online stuff cal um cal i oh, cal yeah, yeah. all that stuff um that was when i really got the the itch to be in a competitive environment and to really learn a game that deeply that i became like one of the top level players that you could you could possibly um that you could get to at the time um I didn't live in Sweden though. I wasn't Swedish, and all the Swedish players absolutely destroyed us every single time. <laughs> Those ninjas so in pajamas. It, that's, yeah. that's the privilege. That yeah. is the privilege. Yeah, Nip was insanely good. 3D was insanely good at the time. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was just really cool growing up in that environment because that's when I think competitive gaming in general really legitimized itself and started. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't even like close to what it is today but it was actually starting to make itself to, to a point where it could be broadcasted people would donate money to it they would sponsor there'd be all kinds of that kind of stuff going on so it was cool absolutely that that was counter-strike i my my memory of like the early days of gaming too is is a hundred percent centered around counter-strike as like the premium shooter alongside halo i would say yeah kind of working yeah. in tandem kind of working um a little bit in like a different thing uh and then obviously my beloved uh fighting games as well as starcraft uh starcraft is the one thing that i i remember being an absolute early thing like early mlg days and stuff yeah. like that yeah. um so for competitivity it's honestly it's it's um it's kind of a crazy thing i forget who i was talking to um but you know obviously with everything going on this this whole year and, and everything being crazy uh one of the interesting things to me is for for me being a member of the fighting game community it's it's pretty much like everything is local uh, and then you mm -hmm. kind of have more ancillary like events when you go online and stuff like that. Uh, for anyone that knows me, they've known I've I'm known to complain about you know tick rate, the way that fighting games have to be peer to peer instead of server based, uh, and a lot of other things that uh, can kind of change the competitive landscape of it. Um, do so. Let me ask you this question about Counter Strike. Went back then because I, I have a theory, and I, I want to see if you can confirm or or unconfirm this this theory. Okay. Do you feel that either servers or net connectivity or anything back in the day, whether it be LAN or you know online events, do you feel that there is a degradation in tick rate or just your the let's let's even take the, the terms out of it. Do you feel that the quality of online play today is better or worse than it was back in the mid two thousands and why? Ooh. That's my that's my my question. We're not going anywhere, Will. There's no there's no tinfoil hat. This is a that's, question. That's interesting. Um honestly, it's like you said with the tick rate, that is the quality of the server, if it has to be on servers online, really, really mattered. Um, and that's why ESEA, every single professional online tournament was at least 128 tick servers. They're expensive, hard to maintain. The high high tier hardware had to be used back then. Nowadays, it's not nearly as bad. Um, but when you went to a LAN, it was a totally different experience. The hit registration, the game itself played so much better. So you always got excited going to a LAN um, versus That's playing cool. like an online satellite or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but compared to today, it really depends on the game. Um, like you can still play Counter Strike on 128 tick servers. It feels good. Valorant feels really good because it's on 128 tick servers. Yeah. Um, you play a game like Destiny, it's awful because the servers tick, are baby. like, yeah, 10, <laughs> yeah. 10, 15 tick. It's it's a joke. Um, it would be yeah. amazing to see Destiny on 128 tick and see how insanely good it would feel. Um, because even though it's on 10 tick, it still feels smooth. The the movement, the mechanics, like the Halo feel around it in terms of movement um yeah. it's good it's solid but the hit registration if it was on 128 tick servers the game would be amazing it'd be so good like it's it's real interesting to see where things are going um because like 
I, I worked forever in, in the Call of Duty esports scene, and I guess technically I still do. Um, uh, but LAN versus online was always like the biggest uh, conversation because you had teams who were just way better online than they were at LAN. Um, yep. And like they would either blame it like LAN jitters or like, I don't know what sort of excuses or susness people accuse online each other. Online warriors. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they just warriors. are online warriors. Oh, yeah. um, but like, I think one thing that's interesting is like, if we were having this discussion in D one, like the, we would have to be talking about how like console esports, whereas like twenty twenty, if we were if we were talking about like yeah, well, like what does a Destiny LAN look like with like servers or LAN connection? Like we're talking yeah. PC, which is a huge, com- like completely huge difference. Like if if you're not aware, um, the PS four is not or is not great for console esports because it forces um the it forces a bluetooth connection on the original version of the DualShock controllers and huh. the uh the updated uh, DualShock controllers that can actually do wired inputs like well so the, the first gen even if you were wired you were still using bluetooth and you were only charging through that cable the second mm-hmm. gen uh had this crazy millisecond delay that um that just made no fucking sense um so <clears throat> For yeah. lands, we had to use these things called Cronuses, uh, where yes. you would it would force raw input out of the controllers, no matter what controller you had, into the into the PlayStation, and uh, it was you know just oh is that standard. one right there, Perk? I literally just looked over my desk. I'm like, wait, I think I just uncovered mine. It was on my desk. Yeah, I've um, never seen one of those. I heard about them, but yeah. never seen one. It's pretty cool. There's they a... let you uh, use mouse and keyboard on uh, yep. D1 on console and stuff like that. To, to I want to add on to Will because. Will just like that is literally the fish bait for me. Like if it if it goes into the ocean, I have to talk about PS4 Dual Shock lag, uh, dude. Like speaking of the PlayStation not being good for esports, uh, th- to go back to what I was saying earlier, fighting games uh, live like on like on land on the same box, uh, whether it be a PC or a PS4. The crazy thing about the PS4 um, for for Street Fighter, that which is the game that I play the most live. Uh, Sony put a lot of in, you know money into the Pro Tour, which is insane. Like, abs- for a player walking away with one of those checks, it's like life changing. So, like, I've got to give credit to it because you know, I, and obviously, I'm sure you guys both know the money that was in the game versus you know back in you know ten years ago versus the money that was in there today uh, is is absolutely a wild world of difference. Yeah. Uh, if we're talking about consoles, the DualShock not only could it only send uh power over the usb for the original generation you there was no way to just desync them quickly like at the end of a session true so if you're thinking like a fighting game tournament we've got let's say each game so like, let's say street fighter has like 20 setups soul caliber has like 20 setups every time a player is done playing when they're they're charging with their cable whenever they're done you grab your cord you know you throw it in your bag your controller is still synced to that playstation Right. So when I go and sit down at a, you know, at a session, even though I'm bringing, you know, an arcade stick, when I, you know, and even, even if both players are bringing an arcade stick, my opponents as well, this has happened to me in a, like, a money tournament. Uh, we sit down, we're both wired connections, we don't have Bluetooth in our controllers at all. We're sitting down playing, uh, and someone who's out in the lobby just bought a shirt and, you know, stuffed it in their bag with their PlayStation controller, that's now hitting the home button. That is now still paired to the console that we're at. The home button launches and pauses our match mid-match. Oh, no. And it is the most insane thing to have to deal with. You'd think like, okay, it's fine. if the, And the rules are if one player pauses the match, they get an automatic uh, round loss. What do you do when it wasn't even that player that paused the match? What do you do uh, if it's a guy in the parking lot? Eject the guy uh, in the parking lot. You, you can't, you can't figure it like, out. You know, yeah, there's no way to figure it out. But it, put, anyway, it's insane. To put a bow yeah. on on sort of um, console esports and, and why we're happy D2 is on PC. Uh, not yeah. only does that happen, the Bluetooth band is so narrow. Like when we did COD events, Very. like the open brackets, like 30 stations times like four or times five per team times ten. So that's uh, sorry, so, sorry times two for two teams. So that's like. 300 300 players ish at a time even if they're like there were situations where people were connected to two playstations at once so we would have pro matches going on on the main stage and all of a sudden they're like their guy is just like looking at the sky looking at the ground like 
other yeah. people from across the venue are controlling their characters. Oh no, because the, that's stuff you don't think about. Yeah, it's crazy. It's it's, it's wild shit. It's nuts, dude. Um, I can't even imagine uh, having to do that. It's it's enough of suffrage just in uh, like playing lands, and of course, like PlayStation kind of becoming the uh, the the default and stuff like that uh, became kind of an issue. Um, so I. I can't even imagine. I know we we got on a tangent with uh, with uh, D one uh, playing it like as an esport, but um, let's go into since we're kind of on Destiny as a whole. I want to I want to pose this question. Okay. Um, one one. Let's let's so let's start. We'll start top level, and then we'll kind of get back to uh, what are the thing. Um, where do you see Destiny? I know you play a lot of PvP, or you you were you were doing it for quite a bit of time, doing lighthouse carries and all that other stuff. I know you still do. Um. But what do you? What are your thoughts as of October first, before Beyond Light? You know, kind of like things that are on the horizon at this moment. What do you think about Destiny as PvP? What's your? What are your thoughts on it? I love it. Honestly, I, it's so much fun. It's one of those where you can hop in, even though there are things that frustrate you. The the meta might be off or just not where you'd want it to be. A meta will never ever be perfect uh, never there's always gonna be something people complain about something's too strong um that's why metas exist uh people always spend the time they crunch the numbers they play for thousands of hours to figure out what the best thing to possibly use is um so the whole idea of a meta to me kind of is it's a little weird um but i think destiny is a game where you can hop in you can play with friends you can um play with all kinds of different types of guns different abilities it's just it's a fun game um but i think a lot of people will try to make it a competitive game myself included i would love to see it be competitive one day because there's a lot of people like the sweat community that you call it there's a lot of people out there that are scrimming together they're doing a lot of things like we used to do back in counter-strike you would scrim together you would make teams you would play in tournaments for money and some organizations have sponsored those tournaments and have organized them, which is cool. So the scene's there. The game is definitely not. is. Yeah. The game is not. Um, the scene tries to force things on the game um, to try to make it competitive and make it esport, um, which is a great start. And I think they've done a lot of really cool things about it, like Fox Packs, um, Triple Rack, like all those guys, they have done a lot of awesome stuff and making rule sets that are pretty cool and make sense. But they take out a lot of things in the game and they force people to use very specific things because there's a ton of RNG in Destiny, the the whole MMO RPG around it. There's a ton of RNG, and RNG does not play well into an esport. Fortnite is a perfect example of that as well. Absolutely. Even though it's a giant esport, there's a ton of RNG that goes into your drops, your um, where you drop the loot that's there, all that kind of stuff. So until RNG is taken out, Counter-Strike is a great example. There's no RNG in that game. None. It's how good your shot is and how well you work together as a team. Everything's yeah. on a level playing field. Uh, the money when you went around is the same, no matter what. If you lose rounds, the, the weapons you can use are the same. Everything's the same. Um, so until Destiny can remove all RNG, and make it very much like Counter-Strike or Valorant, but based in a Destiny environment as much as they can. I don't know what the answer to that is. There's no way it could ever be an eSport, ever, to, in my uh, opinion. To follow up on that, have you played um, any other MMOs PvP? Um, Guild Wars, does that count? Yes, it was an eSport. You said the, you said yeah. the magic Triggered! <laughs> you said the magic word. Was it Guild Wars yeah. 1 or 2? 2. two. Too. Okay. Um, and they took out RNG. They did. You could only use the same weapons. Everyone could use the same thing. And it was <laughs> fun to watch to an extent. Guild Wars 2, like, unless you really played the game, you knew what the hell was going on. It was impossible for the, the announcers, the producers to make people understand what was going on. Yes, it was. And there was so much going on. It, I think people just lost focus after a while. Perk, oh, your face right now is great. All right. Because I Here's... watched your, I watched your face light up what ice was like yeah the guild wars and you were like and he was going on about it and you were like uh-huh tell me more about how good guild wars <laughs> right. and then literally ice goes to an extent and you went like this you went <laughs> no no no. i agree entirely i agree a hundred percent it was just great and it was here's great why um, i appreciated that so much so back when i was a youngin uh like 
I was a huge Guild Wars 1 fan. Um, I followed the development of Guild Wars 2 from the beginning to, to launch, and they promised esports. And me be like me coming into StarCraft at the time I did, I was like, yes, esports is great. Like, uh, and I actually got to um, I got to meet a lot of the people working at on the PvP team for Guild Wars 2 because I ended up casting that game um, a lot back in the day. I was a caster, like a arena and approved shout caster. The problem was there were a lot of uh, th- promises for Guild Wars that just did not come through uh, because the vision was consistently changing for Guild Wars. Um, and they didn't put a spectator client in until like nine months after the game launched. Like it was a, it was a, it was a fucking yeah. mess. Um, yeah. And then even once they did get their esports program off the ground, like it, it was hard to be in that ecosystem. That they, they did not put the attention that they needed to do. Uh, they they needed to give uh, Guild Wars Two PvP to actually be successful. And so it had a very short lifespan. They did a few seasons with ESL. And then, like, now it's just all automated tournaments and, and like, one caster still casts tournaments out off his Twitch. So shout out to Jebro. Miss you, buddy. Um, but I think, you know, that was sort of when esports was a, uh, like, a buzzword. Yeah. But, the, like, yeah. if you, like, I also have had a lot of experience with, um, with World of Warcraft's uh, esports scene, which sort of has its roots back with the heyday of starcraft as well like 2010 mlgs had wow like it was halo the like starcraft in a corner gears and fighting games somewhere and then wow had like a 2010 2011 se- like season on the mlg pro circuit yeah um, i mean that's when that's when soda pop and made his name right right that was yeah. soda that was wreckful rest in peace um yeah. that was um who else Jared, who, like, I fuck. What is this guy's gamer tag? Um, uh, Soda without the pop in was also huge back then. Ven um, yeah, huge name. Sidu, who still plays to this day. Like, there, this is like an, an example of an MMO whose PvP scene, like, it has problems. Like, the biggest being balance and like, ha- like having to, um, not like have its own ecosystem against the pve ecosystem which mm-hmm. destiny definitely has as well um but at least it gets the like a t- like attention and time it deserves from both like the developers and the the community um it just strikes me as so odd that like we have bungie who created halo which sort of kept north american esports alive until like starcraft would come and blow that bubble up uh without having them like involved in a destiny 2 esports scene yeah i uh yeah i mean i i think it's it's one of those interesting things like i remember reading like the early days of the internet the flack for when halo 2 changed i think splash damage on grenades um i remember there was a patch it was one of the first First times for me, because I all of my PC PC experience was uh, in like the earlier in the '90s, playing like the first Doom and Age of Empires and stuff. Um, I got mostly into console gaming for a long period of time. So you know, reading, seeing a patch, seeing you know, seeing a map pack or different things like that, that you can go to the store and buy um, DLC and and the, having the concept of that and games can change, um, especially you know with Xbox Live and stuff like that. Um, it was interesting to see Bungie's approach to it. Um, and how that approach sort of has carried over um, into Destiny. I There was a lot of talk always when D1 first came out, where is it's going, or the, the thought is, you know, is Destiny really this great game that has tons of engagement and hours and, and friendships formed? Or is Destiny 1 really a flash in the pan? And I remember having a lot of apprehension going into Destiny 2, just um, just over the fact that, I was already kind of leaving, you know, console games coming into back into PC and different things like that. And I always kind of, you know, hoped when, when playing D1, uh, obviously the, uh, you know, we, we talked briefly about uh, console PvP and stuff like that and how Destiny doesn't really work at LAN um, and different things like that. Uh, but we, you know, like we were saying, Ice, with, uh, with the RPG, you know, RPG, RNG elements baked into it. How do you make a, uh, you know, a game feel good and feel fair to everybody, especially um, with stuff like that. So yeah. I like when you, when you look at Bungie and you look at their kind of MO with that stuff, I think 
for them with with Halo, when they first had Halo, I know their whole concept was, hey, how do we make Halo and have people coming back to it every day? How do we do all of that stuff? Um, but it's always as interesting to me as it is, and as much as they had MLG playlists built in to uh, Halo 3, Halo Reach, uh, and that amazingly competitive, balanced, fair, even, uh, you know, symmetrical maps, you know, going for power weapons, you know, in the middle, uh, you know, or on the fringe or something like that. Uh, it's interesting to me that when you look at Destiny 2 as PvP, I see some maps that are absolutely brilliant. Um, I see some weapons that function so, so, so well and so interesting. But it almost feels like Bungie, I don't know if it's Bungie or, or how the game is designed or the, or the place that they want to take the game, right? Because one of the things too, is you notice is they want to take the game in a lot of different places. Yeah. But my curiosity is, do they know where they want PvP to live and how they want that experience to play out for players? Obviously, we have Trials that was recently brought back. Um, but it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. So, Ice, I'd love to hear just your, your spitball like ideas for like, you know, you're in Bungie's head. What do you think? Where do yeah. you think that they're going? Where would, you, where would you like to see them? Like, I know we talked about sweat changes and stuff. What changes would you actually like to see in PvP? Yeah. So, Outside of, you know, you know, tick rate and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I think without having separate sandboxes, you have to separate PvE from PvP. You can't, you cannot have the same weapons within both environments. One side will basically be left behind because of tuning the weapon for one specific thing. And I think with the changes that they're making to the engine, they're not writing a new engine, but the changes that they're making, I think, and you've seen it on a couple weapons. I can't think off the top of my head what they were, but you've seen them make changes on them that are PvP specific or PvE specific, which is awesome. If they can do that across the board and split the balancing from PvP to PvE, that would bring in the, you'd have to have more people. You'd have to have a team dedicated to PvP balancing. You'd have to have a lot more resources around that, which I think after the Activision split, they lost a ton of their resources. They lost a lot of money, people, um, they lost um, Vicarious Visions as a huge part of their PvE um, development team. Um, I think they've they've been building themselves back, but without those teams of people dedicated to managing those things after the split, one would fall short, obviously. Um, I agree. But when the, if if that split, I think from my perspective, what I would like to see if it was competitive, PvP is a lot of fun in quick play. I think you could leave a lot of the the things in quick play and let people use the PVE environment within quick play. But in competitive trials, if you ever had an esports time, like a super ranked playlist, like a League of Legends, people are trying to go for Challenger to try out for teams to get noticed by scouts and that kind of thing. Um, it would have to be set loadouts that are the same that players can pick. Um, so kind of like kind of like COD and that kind of thing. Everyone has everything available to them. There's no RNG elements to the role, the perks and things that you have. You get to pick exactly. And then yep. the armor, there's no stats to them. There's nothing that accelerates your skills outside of maybe like everything. Everyone can pick it as part of their build. Um, but they, they don't have things that are better because they grinded the game in PVE and they got this insane role and no one else can get that because they got really lucky. Um, and then in the game, Jav 4 is one of my favorite maps. You have to have balance. Um, the objectives have to be, you, you have to test teams going at the exact same time, being able to get there at the exact same time. Yeah. There's a lot of maps where one side can get the heavy way before the other. Um, and that decides around. I mean, generally heavy decides around. A team can get there, throw up a Titan shield, they can grab heavy, they win the round. Um, yeah. And then what I've always said, in terms of supers and stuff like that, without supers, Destiny would not feel like Destiny. I think supers need to still be in the game, but there's two ways that I think I'd go about it. One, a super would be an objective, like a heavy in the middle of the map, and people would fight for a super. Um, and you would have to control the super for a little bit and stand on it as like kind of a control zone, and then the person would get the super in the control zone. Um, okay, I like that. Or everyone starts with a super, and the entire game, they only get one super. And how you use it tactically as a team is up to you. 
Um, but that's it. You only get one super and there's no recharge. There's no intellect. There's no hundred intellect. You sit at the back of the map. So no one can kill you. And then you just go out and kill everyone with a super, all that kind of bullshit. Um, yeah, uh, that is, that's actually super interesting. That you mentioned that it's one of the things that we've, we always kind of are, are spitballing ideas of like, how would we make it more interesting? How would we make it better? Um, you know, we've, we've done our own share of, we've been trying to like kind of squat together and keep our teams consistent. Uh, cause we're much more like, you know, for, for a lot of us, it's PVE. Um, yeah. there's a couple of us, I mean, like space moose, uh, mm -hmm. X lock our Titans, not in, uh, class, but in, uh, caliber skill. player <laughs> in caliber of, uh, of, of skill in PVP for sure. Right. On. Um, so, uh, me, Will and Moose are like our Saturday morning trials team. Um, but it's interesting, uh, the, the super concept, because that's something that I've always kind of felt a little bit either cheated by or felt like I had it too easy. Um, some, sometimes you just get a ton of kills and you're just like, oh, my super is up already. Yeah. Like, I should probably just use this to wipe this round just because I'll hopefully have one if we need to, if it comes down to a clutch, you know, if they, if they start winning some rounds coming back um, and you have that, it, it almost, it almost feels, I mean, it, it definitely feels like it's a crutch and certain supers just feel so much stronger than others. So I actually love, I love both of the ideas that you outlined. They're, those are two that I've never really thought about. Uh, being forced to be exposed in a central capture point is really, really interesting. Um, but then also, honestly, for trials, um, maybe even just if they came at like, you know, once it was, once both teams had three rounds or maybe after like five rounds had total had, uh, had transpired uh, this way, if you have a team that, you know, has a certain amount of losses, you know, let's say you're going to, you're about to get stomped out of, you know, Oh five, you yeah. know, maybe, maybe once you're down a certain amount of rounds or something like that, there's a, there's a lot of flexibility. I think that, uh, that, that I, brings up personally, I would not want to see rubber band mechanics in a competitive game, rubber yeah. band mechanics. I think make the experience super rough. You're talking about um, like comebacks. Yeah. So like, okay. were you, were you meaning like if you were down Oh four, you would just get yeah. super and then be able yeah. to, to rubber band. I don't like that. Personally. It's the same reason why everyone hates the blue shell and Mario Kart, man. Like yeah. right. you you're being punished for being in the lead. That, that's so so I honestly I have I I agree with you for a for a lot of extents. My favorite fighting game franchise, Street Fighter, uh the current iteration has the worst comeback mechanic of all time. It's called uh V meter. Uh basically when you take enough hits, you have this meter where you literally just get to go nuts for oh, about yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, you, you might have even seen me complaining about how it, it's honestly, it turns a lot of people off to the game. Because, it, you know, and I, I talk with a lot of friends about this all the time too, is that the comeback mechanics used to just be, you know, just be good. If you're good enough to have your defense kind of stand against their offense, you, that's your comeback. Uh, and I know Harold Gorgeous is saying Golden Freeze in chat when we play Dragon Ball Fighters. Uh, <laughs> my, so let me, as much as I hate the rubber band mechanics, and I agree with you guys, I do want to play devil's advocate for a second. Um, okay. And it kind of leads into, 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 into one specific thing. Um, I think if, for whatever it would be, uh, for trials or however they want to structure comp or any of that stuff, I do feel like this would be its, at its best in its own playlist. Um, but looking into Destiny just the way that it is, uh, with trials being a piece that everybody is kind of always, you know, generally been like a love, you know, either love, hate, or like a love, love relationship with. Um, one of the things that we've even noticed too is as we've been kind of trying to stay steady with trials and kind of learn the maps, learn the callouts and everything like that. Um, one thing to note is the declining player base. It's hard to, it's hard to ignore. Um, sometimes we've even had a team that will, you know, we stomped a team and then we'll go right into playing them again, uh, yeah. whether it be trials or comp. Uh, and in comp, it happens a ton because it's not required to really. And we're bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we, we have our moments. We have our moments, but we're certainly not. Uh, hey, you're not learning. that bad. I've watched you guys play. You're not bad. Well, we're not but, like, we're not at the top tier where it's like expected that you run into the same people over and over right. again, right? Like that's right. that's exactly what I'm saying. Is that we're we're not in a caliber where you would think that like based on Elo. I know trials goes by card wins. Um, but that you'd be kind of like facing these same players. So my the where I'm where I'm kind of going with this is the comeback mechanic is always shit when you're looking at it from a competitive standpoint. The other thing that I'm thinking of is. And, and maybe you can shed some light into this because um, I think this is a great discussion point is how would you then make the game or do something to incentivize players that aren't that good or that want to get good um, 
how would you give them and how would you structure the game to give them a fighting chance being down, you know, four rounds to nothing in in a trials or a comp match or something like that without a comeback mechanic? Like, what would you, uh, what would you do? It's a hard <clears throat> question, but I, that's I'm I'm curious to see the thoughts because I I'm with it too. Like, I hate comeback mechanics. Like, I really do. Um, but I'm just I'm just thinking in terms of like. You know, we we've had rounds where we've gotten we're we're kind of fledgling against a team and we're feeling like we're getting dumpstered. But I'm like, hey, Haro Gorgeous, you got your super? And he's like, yeah, I got my super. I'm like, pop that Dawn Blade. Let's see if we can we you know we can get going. You know, maybe we can kind of start turning. You know, even if it's survival or something like that, an attrition based game. Um, so what what do you think? And this this goes for both of you, Will. If you've got something, I I want to hear it too. What do you think can be done in place of a comeback mechanic to not desaturate a uh, playlist population will you want to start yeah absolutely uh so for, for me like it you have to have a reward structure that um incentivizes you playing regardless of win loss in addition to the the climb that is comp that also needs like a better reward structure and then you also like you also need to have uh a system that you know, I think the problem with games like League of Legends is like the toxicity. Uh, you spend so much in time investing into like a single game, um, yeah. and you know you lose that, and it's so disheartening. Um, yeah, Destiny is not like that. Thank God. Like I can lose a billion comp games in a row on stream, and the only thing that's hurt is my ego because I look like shit in front of like all of our fans and friends, and <laughs> um, and it's not. Like th that's the reason I feel bad. It's not. I don't feel bad because I lost, um, it, because the the mechanics of Destiny are so rewarding. The gunplay is so rewarding. The problem is that like without a reward structure that gives people a reason to play, they're not going to get to the the moment to moment like, oh, I'm enjoying this game part of it. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I my I'll devil's advocate that too, and that that can kind of be a, a two-edged sword in, in some instances. I agree with you. I, I think the reward structure needs to be a lot better in general. My thought is that would almost, you would have a similar situation when you see people AFKing in Gambit try to get a quest completion or something like that. You're going to have people that are... The, my thing is, you want people to show up. You want them to try. You want them to get that same level try. of investment. You want them to try. Uh, <laughs> you want that same level of investment that you do. You know what I mean? Like for us as, you know, as average, you know, pvpers you you, you kind of want like you know in a game like destiny you you need to play off of teammates and you need to play together so my thing is you know if you make it if it's too rewarding you're gonna have people that never play that are just like well shit i'm going to get that you know i can get this gun easy from doing this and you know then i can go back to doing the thing that i want to do i see it honestly i don't think that's a problem, gambit though. I think the problem with Gambit is that like it doesn't have a, a reward structure outside of just sitting in the game. Like if you, like I'm talking about two separate reward structures. Like yes, you like get skill based one. like you get like a skill based one that that is where the aspirational top tier loot is. But you're still getting like materials maybe from sit, like sitting playing through uh, a, a comp match and losing. But also that uh, that speaks to like Bungie's predilection towards like booting you from a match if you AFK like. We do that in Forges. Why don't we do that yeah. in Gambit and PvP? Yeah, that's true. Um, so you're saying your solution would be to make more things kind of like the Recluse Mountaintop, where it's it's just so desirable that you're going to have people trying. Yeah, hard. and it's so, like it's so good specifically. Like Recluse Mountaintop is good everywhere. I like. I think. Yeah. I think there should be guns that are good in PVE that come from PvP. But I think that like those should be like locked behind fucking Luna's and not forgotten quests. <laughs> like, like they need to have big arcing spanning quests that give you reason to play the game mode over time. And like these, like the reason why people love Luna's and not forgotten is not is not just because they're good. Like people still go for them now because they're hard to get and they're like Prestigious. points of pride. People like that people they shouldn't be, but they make money carrying people to those guns. Yeah, that's it. Make a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> Not forgotten I, used to be seventeen hundred dollars from start oh to finish. God, that's insane. Back when it first came out and it was a one eighty. But yeah. I think I agree there should be some aspirational things to go after, but 
making it something that changes the game in terms of balance isn't that's where we've run into problems where you have the sweats and the casuals yeah the sweats get all the things they're super super good lunas and all that that makes the sweats exponentially better because the gun is exponentially better they're the only ones that can get it and then they start dumpstering the casuals even harder and the casuals hate it because of that um yep. absolutely so for me personally i think if it's pve focused and it's a pve weapon sure i, I think aspirational stuff you like make it ridiculous in pve it's a really really good weapon you did run into issues with the recluse being the only gun that you could use in pve in high level content we've run into the same thing with mountaintop yeah. um we've run into the same thing with windigo um Th those are metas that we had talked about before and it's impossible to get away from a meta because there's always something on paper math wise that is the best and if you're looking to be the best you have to use the best um i think that's always going to be a thing but you don't want to make things that are so strong that no matter what you do you have to use those things if you're trying to do a raid do the in-game content right. even from a casual perspective um mm, yeah. i think personally if they put in a system where you can get recognized for how good you are at something, um, I'll give you an old example in Counter-Strike. Cal O, you were just starting. Mm -hmm. Cal I M, you had gotten out of Cal O, you had won, like you had gotten into the playoffs, you had done a decent job, you got into I M. Cal Main, you freaking knew what you were doing at the game. If you're a Cal Main player, yeah, you were good. Cal I, you were professional level. Cal, then they put in Cal P because there were so many people in that like kind of limbo between Cal Main and Cal I, they mm -hmm. put in Cal P Premier to kind of be that trying ground to get into invite. And then once you're an invite, pro teams were looking at you pretty much. That's the same thing with um, like the, the bronze, silver, gold, platinum, diamonds, challenger. And now they put a lot of different tiers in master, grandmaster, challenger for League of Legends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, they signify people at those levels by like cosmetic things so the border around their their avatar make it really freaking cool and really recognizable now they've put in um if you're a challenger when you recall you have a golden recall um yeah, cool. so it's it's stuff like that to me high level players want to be recognized for how good they are at something but the casuals at the same time want something to aspire to and i say casuals that's just like not the people at the top one percent um, they want to aspire to something, but be recognized for where they are. So they, they get recognized for progress. Right. Um, I think the titles were a good start. So unbroken, flawless. But if you're not, if you don't have it done, you don't get recognized for it. Otherwise, right. you just have this ELO thing that's in Destiny Tracker, and it's kind of whatever. No one really cares that much. Yeah. Um, but if you if took that for it. and put it in the game and made a system around it where, I don't know, you could, based on the rank you were at, it's like... Um, World of Warcraft, based on the rank yeah. that you're at, you could buy different looking Mounts. armor and you could yeah. look freaking cool if you're a yeah. warlord or whatever it was. That's what I was going to bring uh, up, actually, was uh, like, that's 100% like, the, I think the right way to go. Like, get give us cosmetics like sparrows, ghost shells, armor sets instead of like actual weapons. It also makes it so you don't have to worry about like the like coding behind something. And I think yeah. we we see that like sort of on the horizon with um was it not beloved the the new one um adored is that the name of it adored yeah beloved with a scarf yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah. and just the different scarfs you can equip it with um Pretty cool yeah like that that's sort of the direction that they seem to be going um so I I kind of want to use this as a jumping off point like we 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 see what's coming for Beyond Light you know despite the delay. What are your like? What are your opinions on what we've seen so far for Beyond Light? And then after that, we'll talk about what your hopes are for it. I'm, I'm excited for Beyond Light. I'm still skeptical, um, because of the things that are just basically reskins. I wish they would have gone a little bit further and made some brand new stuff. I hope the stuff that's coming, in terms of Adored and all that, they have brand new perks. I hope it's not literally snapshot quick draw or some kind of combination of that yeah i'm gonna go nuts if it is that <laughs> um but I'm, I'm i'm skeptical but i'm excited because there's I, I can tell they're putting a lot of focus on how to make the end game 
something that people want to strive to get to and something that lasts for a while. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I don't really have that much more of an opinion. Um, what I would like to see is the raid be last wish difficulty. I hope there's only less than 50 teams that are able to do it day one. Um, that said, though, I hope that it's the teams that get it done. I hope that there's a chance that those teams go out and help other players as much as possible to get their day ones. I just don't want it to be... I want it to be something where people that put in a lot of work and are extremely good at the game kind of get recognized for that. But then the players that have also put in a lot of work um, get recognized, but in a different way. So like the raid jackets or a different emblem for like the first week versus the first day. Oh, the first day is very small in terms of teams that are able to complete and the first week is much wider. Um, so kind of having more more gradients, more more colors of the gradient in terms of how well or or what you can kind of achieve for both, you know, we're yeah. talking about PvP, but also for PvE. Because you look at Last uh, Wish, yeah. you see the Redeem Boys with that. There's only four teams in the world. Three teams. Yeah, four? I don't know. That have that emblem. That's insane. Right. You see someone with that emblem, you know that they killed it yes. on that raid. A hundred percent. Um, I mean, we have, we have, there's, what's interesting to me is that Destiny has had such an expansive growth over what uh, other individuals can do with, like, the API uh, that Bungie made. Like, the, the data is there. Like, the, yeah. the crazy thing to me is that, like, we, you know, we were talking about, like, the patch of Halo 2 earlier, like, and just kind of, like, not really knowing where Bungie even feels like they want to go. The interesting thing to me is that they've made this API that can track all that stuff. So going on with what you're saying, like the, the Redeem Clan and like a couple of others that have that day one emblem for for Last Switch, and everybody remembers, you know, Datto coming in, like, Dado. Was, like yeah. you know, two yeah. seconds after or something like that. Yeah, two minutes. Um, two two minutes. Um, and you've got that stuff we, where you have things also on um, Braid Report that says like, hey, you know, like I know for some of us we got like, hey, like you did this day one, or you know, you did this flawless and stuff like that. Those things are really, really cool. Um, and honestly, I when they brought in that feature where you can kind of track different things with your emblems, um, I thought that was awesome. I was like, this is so cool. You can now, not only can you have an emblem that is of prestige, uh, just for, from its visual look when you see somebody you know, with it, um, but also that you're kind of like tracking some stuff. But it also kind of fell short a little bit too. There is, um, I have on, on our, there were the group of us that did it, we have like 18 minutes or something like that on, um, I think it's the, uh, the Garden of Salvation rate, like your fastest time, like on the emblem. Yeah. We didn't do it in 18 minutes. I think we just loaded in at a checkpoint and we just did it in 18 minutes. But oh, like, yeah. That's like tracked that's, in the game. That's uh, stuff like that. That's when we do uh, the final checkpoint boss like swap where you're like, oh, I'm going to load in my hunter and we're going like, right. to do it. And then it just counts the time that the character loaded in. You took us 18 minutes to kill the last boss. Yeah, and I, I see some people with like, you know, I did it in four minutes or whatever. And like, that's that's dope. But like, it's also like it it comes so close to doing something really, really cool. Um, but then also kind of like drops the ball. Like, like, like yeah. it gets so close. They get so close with some of these things. and They kind of drop the ball. Yeah, uh, I like I do like what you're saying, though, with um kind of having more things uh, for caffeine's. Uh, we've done the last two raid jackets. We've gotten like a large percentage of us uh, pushed through to get the raid jackets, which is awesome. And shout outs to everybody that's in that. We're going for uh, with the new raid. We're I'm trying to get everybody into shape to do um, a 24 hour. We're gonna try Day to do a 24 hour do uh, it. and put that do together. It. You so guys that's, can do that's it. like that's like our next challenge that we want to take on. So we're like, all right, we can we can definitely. I know that we could definitely get the the first week you know completion, but we want to get that the 24 hour with the challenge modifier on kind of whole yep. thing. Um, yep. But I love what you're saying with that too, and I I, I want to just touch briefly back on PvP um, with it because I think that is something that means a lot. I know Moose mentioned this in chat too. Uh, why isn't there a basic Crucible title? Why isn't there something something in the middle that like your intermediate player can get and earn to you know have themselves recognized? And that goes for PVE as well. Um, it almost feels like the they have kind of Bungie has two extremes, and this covers into the the scarves that are on the beloved. I love that that's the idea of where they're going, but I also am concerned that it's they're just looking at it going, hmm, all right, we we kind of need like two or three little milestones on top of this singular milestone being getting the the gun. Right. And then kind of like you can modify it with the skin that you have on there and stuff like that. Um, but I, I do firmly agree that we need a lot more 
work in the middle for players to kind of feel like they're achieving because otherwise you're sitting there going well i have wayfarer title and then like even though you've done so much other stuff you might you may have fallen short of chronicler or curse breaker or you know riven's bane or something like that but you might be really 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 close and you've done more than the player who just you know has wayfarer also shout out to everybody with just wayfarer i'm not talking shit i'm just using it as a benchmark of, of the thing like wayfarer is still dope i'm sorry like don't hate me for it um but you know what i mean by that like it's, it's yeah, kind yeah. of just like a you know there's there's step there's shelf number one and then the next shelf up is like way higher and it requires a lot more you know of a you know uh an achievement to kind of get there and stuff like that so i i do fully agree i don't really i mean i'd love to hear your thoughts if you know of a way how you know we can integrate that and stuff because i don't really know i mean getting getting a nightfall emblem for doing the pve quest for the season just doesn't feel this ain't it chief you know what i mean like it's yeah just, it's just... yeah i mean it, honestly i think it's just it revolves around like having some kind of type of recognition around your emblem for how high you've made it within a certain or not not even the emblem something somewhere whether it's like in armor glow, like there's a specific set of ornaments for an activity, and it looks different based on how high you've made it. Um, I don't know. I think the onus for that needs to be put put on the design team, who's insanely good, and they do probably the best work out of anyone at Bungie. Everyone at Bungie does an yeah. amazing job, but the design team consistently nails it every single time. Um, I agree. They're killing it constantly. So I, I feel like they are creative enough to come up with something where... Based on the activity that you're doing, there's something in the game that changes and looks super freaking cool. Kind of like the bronze through challenger look stuff within League of Legends. Um, mm. You get a whole new banner, you get a different avatar border, you get a different recall animation in the game. There's all kinds of different shit in that game to signify how far you've made it. Um, if they take that concept and just put it into Destiny, whether it's ornaments, emblem, title, I don't know. Um, I think that would be a, something that people would want to strive for, and it shows off how far they've made it in a special type of activity. Yeah, you know, just to piggyback off that, like, Guild Wars did that too, and it paid off because you had this... Um, you had this rank system that really was just an EXP bar for PvP, but every time you filled that shit up, like every ten levels, you got a new finisher. Like every time you killed somebody, you like you started off rabbit, and then you went to like deer, and then it would like bear, tiger, all the way up to like dragons. Like, yeah. Give us some ridiculous shit like that. Um, even down to like the frame for health bars that we see that shows like our class. Like we don't really necessarily need to see. The class of somebody in that like it used to be a level number we're used to not seeing that information and we're used to just sort of identifying a guardian based off of their armor now um yeah. why not like have some harmless like rank in there especially in pvp matches because you're always going to see those health box bars and like level boxes and shit yeah yeah i agree any, honestly any... things as simple as that yeah Easy. completely agree Easy Just money, boys. And cosmetics and stuff. All right, let's 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 talk about the future of Destiny even further down the line. Uh, you know, when they announced, announced Beyond Light, they also announced um, that instead of like a Destiny three, they announced like two more DLC like uh, titles for Destiny two. It was the Witch Queen and then Lightfall, which is the working title for the one beyond that. Um, in addition to that, we're not getting a, a new engine. We're iterating on the systems in Destiny 2. Ice, how yeah. do you feel that sort of lays the foundation for the, the game going forward? Personally, I wish they dropped the number. Um, I mean, Same. at this point, it's just Destiny. It's always been Destiny. Like, is if they're not going to go to Destiny 3, then it should just be Destiny, you know? Um, 100% agree. But the engine, I, I've worked long enough in technical environments from a high level to understand the work that goes into making something like that. And if you have to overhaul an engine, you pretty much have to remake your entire game. So I think they, they recognize that they've pigeonholed themselves into what they have today. And I think what they've done with it and pulling pieces out to rework it around the engine and rework some things so that it functions better in the engine is good um but 
I, I think Destiny has a really bright future through its lifespan the rest of the way. I think they're finally getting to the point where they're starting to storytell a lot better than they ever have before. They're starting to tie pieces together. There's like 8 million different storylines going on in Destiny, and none of them have been tied together. Um, yeah. But I think as the darkness is coming in now, I think this is going to be the focal point for a lot of these different stories coming into one thing. Um, because as far as we know right now, the darkness is like the ultimate enemy. We don't know if it's actually an enemy right now. Um, they've kind of given hints and things where the darkness might actually not be the enemy, and it could be something else that's been around us the whole time. Um, so I think that's super cool. I think the story of Destiny is amazing. Um, I really, really hope that they take the engine as far as it possibly can in terms of optimization in the game. I hope they eventually make the game. They will make it 60 FPS on the new consoles. It plays so well on PC. I hope they take the tick rates up in terms of like how the game performs in terms of hit registration and things like that. Um, but who knows? Who knows? Um, but I think I honestly think for the rest of Destiny's life, there's a bright future. If, if it falls flat with Beyond Light and it's not good, Destiny might be dead. And as a game, honestly, like I will say that here, I think it's probably not going to ever come back. I think this is the last chance that Bungie really has to blow everyone out of the water or the game's pretty well. It's not going to grow. I'll say that. I, I actually agree with you entirely. And I, it's kind of a weird thing is I, I often feel like no matter what expansion is on the horizon or coming, we always kind of get into this mindset of, hey, this is make or break for Destiny. And it, it's been, it's not been the same reason every time, right? When, when D1 first launched, it was the biggest new IP launch in history at that moment. Um, there was a lot of buzz about the game and there was a ton of great, great talent, not only just in the studio, but in the, uh, the vocal booth, um, you know, for representing these characters in, in a, you know, in a big, uh, expansive world. Um, but by the time that, uh, Taking King was about to come out, uh, Trials essentially saved the game for that summer, that, that first, yeah. uh, summer stretch. Uh, and then it was like, oh, like this game is really maker. I remember Taking King being the make or break uh, expansion for Destiny. Yeah. Um, so it, and it feels just like everything is there. Like we were like, oh, Destiny 2 is really the make or break where it's like, oh, you know, Rise of Iron is really the make or break for Destiny. Forsaken is the make or break for Destiny. Let's uh, be honest. Shadow Keep is a really thing. Like, launch. Remember, like even from launch, there have been issues. Yeah, yeah right. that's yeah. that's always and, the thing, too, is like I feel I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, let me just say this ahead. point. Like I feel like we're always it's always crunch for destiny uh, all the friends that i've gotten into destiny over the years um you know shout outs to everybody that's that's joined recently it's been a bunch of you guys um but it's always felt like it's make or break and i always feel like uh, just this morning uh, a new friend was playing and i had to ex basically explain to him like hey yeah i know the quest system is kind of insane and like wants you to go like all over these planets and stuff like that whereas you know we we've made the argument we're like why don't they just have you in a starting zone like an mmo um, but ultimately, it comes down to, uh, even for different reasons, on Bungie's side, you know, whether it be the Activision splits, you know, or Activision themselves feeling like it's the thing that was, you know, doing it, or or whatever the kind of the, the community's, you know, hypothesis on why it's make or break for the game. Um, I completely agree with you, Ice. Like, it, it, it's kind of, it's really a big time make or break for the game. Uh, I think this might be a hot take, because I know everybody was kind of bummed to find out that the leak or whatever it was about um the uh the new engine thing not being true i actually don't think it's that much of an issue and i think there's a lot of new tech on the horizon especially yeah. that they're involving in the new consoles like load optimizations and stuff like that i feel like if it was a more seamless world that we can explore they might be able especially now that they're kind of doing this vault system where they're rotating content out optimizing it uh Who's to see? Maybe by the time that they take out the EDZ, for example, when it, when it comes back with you know better load optimizations, let's say that that's like a normal thing for every gamer. There's some new spots that they might be able to open up because of how well they can optimize not only the textures but also the load experience for the player, where they yeah. might be actually loading you to a new instance, but it feels like you know more instance stuff. I'd love to uh, see bigger instances. Just kind of going along that point, I'd love to see instances where more people can be there. And then like Guild Wars, there's like those big hunt in Final Fantasy 14. There's those big mm -hmm. hunt events where there's a giant boss on the map and there's like 100 people all shooting at the same boss. Mm -hmm. I think That's they need easy. to get to that point. Instead of like eight people just kind of roaming around killing ads, like having yeah. 100 people in an instance all banding together to kill this giant boss, be pretty cool. 
Oh yeah, I, I've agree. been uh, I've been playing. Um, Will and I have played uh, our share between Guild Wars and Elder Scrolls Online for me. And Final Fantasy. Uh, and Final yeah. Fantasy, we did play Final Fantasy. Yeah. Um, we're I think we're on your server. If you ever got back into that and wanted to kick around, I probably in it. But, will um, eventually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, one of the things that I loved seeing was um, people going into all chat and going, "Hey, the world boss is up." Like any time that I'm in a town in Elder Scrolls, they're like, "Hey." You know, if anybody's around, please come help kill this boss. Like, I need to drop from it. And there's just like big ass bosses, like, yeah. like almost like strike bosses out just standing around, like tons of them outside of town. Yeah. And they have their spawn points, they have their loot, their own uh, gear systems, their own sets that come from them. And you kind of just got to go, hey guys, you know, come together. There's a there's a big guy outside the gate, you know, who wants to come? Uh, even if you don't need anything, just port to me, you know, uh, and and stuff. And like that brings a lot of community together and i know destiny actually to me from from my outset on playing the game since alpha has actually done the social thing better than most other games have yeah um but i think in terms and that's just that's just social person to person i think in game it needs to do a better job of kind of bringing people together exactly like you're saying with yeah. the uh with the world boss kind of yeah. uh, aspect and stuff like that it can public definitely... events aren't it the, yeah, the focus that they put on public events up. yeah 11 yeah i get bigger than that yep um agreed so Two tokens in the blue come on yeah. <laughs> well that was crucible matches too um it so, was for a while yeah uh i do want to bring up a point that we haven't really thought about about like the future of destiny and, and sort of where it's been so the first real like non-activision release wasn't shadowkeep it was like the seasonal content after shadowkeep right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um we got to think about it this way so like we know Bungie paid $164 million for the rights to publish Destiny from Activision. Yep. That's a shit ton of cash. Oh, wow. um, that And they had an additional, according to the article I pulled up, it's they have an additional $20 million on top of that was that was tied up into uh, like sub-season passes and stuff that was going through Activision. So $184 million at the end of the day is a huge chunk of change, which also means that they took that money uh, and probably had to lay off people. Uh, they yeah. probably had, they had to downsize. They we also know for a fact that they were working on another IP at the time. So like we haven't really take like we haven't really taken into account just how dire things have been because I everything that they've released to me seems like they're understaffed. Like they have these great ideas and like we're seeing like what we're getting is amazing but it's just like there's not enough time for like the man like the man hours to get the stuff out that we want to see um yeah. so what i'm hoping is that we're get gonna get like an amazing product out of beyond light but i'm not sure if beyond light is not 100 percent on launch that, that is the the end i think you know like it needs to do well and they need to get a lot of revenue so that they can continue to expand like their uh, their design team, their like their armor team, fucking and anything, so that they can yeah. generate enough to like build the, like their the bungee machine back up. But I feel like we're we're either at the end of or about to experience sort of the first the end of the first phase of like a rebuilding in in Bungie's machinery. That, 100% agree. Um, that is, I think I've so said different. on. I've said on stream and other podcasts before the team at Bungie, the live team that's been making the seasonal updates has to be like 25 people. Right. Like there's, yeah. there's no way it's a lot of people. Um, and I'd feel for really sure. bad for those people because they've put a sh probably a shit ton of work in, um, and yeah. haven't gotten the appreciation they deserve. But the, I know from the raid perspective, the raid team has literally gone from garden and all they've done is this new raid for the last, what year and a half, two years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, the team that is at Bungie that has been working on Beyond Light has been, I think, the full team that they've rebuilt since the Activision split. And I think, Will, you make a good point. Um, the amount of money that went into it, the layoffs that had to happen, the restructuring that had to happen, they lost Vicarious Visions, who came up with some of the best PvE content moon. they've ever had, and High Moon. Yeah. Um, they lost a ton, and they've had to figure out their own processes. How did they publish? Who does it? Um, and I think their leadership probably changed as well. So I think from Luke Smith's perspective and the leaders of Bungie, it must have been a nightmare trying to figure out how to make this work after the split. Yeah. Um, but what we've gotten so far for the last five seasons now has been very 
meh to bad. Yeah. Um, and that's not to discredit the work that the team that did it put in, but that's all they could do with the resources and the time and the people that they had. Um, yeah. But they've said that Beyond Light is something that they've been working on for a long time, years now. And that's what the team's been focused on for a while. The main team, it has to be insanely good. If I, it's not, then it's kind of just like, what, what, this is it? This is all you guys can offer with the team? Because this is the yeah. first big one that the team has put out, I think, when they've been almost at full strength. I'd probably say like 85, 90% strength from when they were with Activision. Absolutely agree. I know um, oftentimes a lot of people, you know, there's, there's, you know, in the Destiny community, inevitably, in any community for gaming, uh, you're gonna have some people that are just like, I can't believe this is all they're doing. I can't believe this is that. I can't believe this is that. You, you could literally be the best thing ever, and you, you're still gonna have people that are just gonna be complaining about it. That's just the nature of the world. But um, one of the things that I always think about is sometimes your critics are also the people that love it the best right, and love it the most, and that like. I think there's going to be always a percentage of people, like you're saying, like people that just want to complain, that just want to see something crash and burn. But by and large, we want the game to be good. I would love a universe where I'm so caught, you know, into the the whirlwind of Destiny, so involved in, you know, deciphering what gun, what role on an auto rifle is better for X situation or Y situation, you know, just for PVE alone than letting go, you know, let alone going into Gambit or, or PvP. And different things like that i think everybody would just love to have more to kind of get themselves engrossed in um but ultimately like it does kind of come down to manpower um my my optimism actually comes from like what will mentioned the amount of money that bungie paid to get the publishing rights uh from activision um and the the amount of users i mean if you look at a lot of other games that have kind of had their troughs and you know and their waves and stuff like that too like wow had been kind of on a decline for years until legion uh and basically yeah like it got um, right. so bad that blizzard stopped publishing numbers yeah right and, uh, and there is though there were people nobody you know no fan of wow ever wanted to be i know we always joke that wow is like the ultimate like sunk cost fallacy where a lot of people you know will want to play it just because they're like well my sub's been going on uh, Bro, a friend I, of like, a i'm still paying play, paying for a sub and i haven't played like i haven't played wow since i left blizzard. yeah <laughs> like, i have a friend of a friend who actually blizzard sent him like a gold or like a bronze like statue of uh uh, uh garrosh just because he had been paying as a sub since like day one and like never missed like a month or something wow, like that. wow. uh th there is there's people that have that devoted loyalty to it and i think no matter who it are, if, if it's you know from people like us that are just so engrossed and so loving the game that want to take you know we love to force you know new friends like straight off the bench right into a raid we're going hey you've been playing for a day how do you like it it's good all right let's go get whisper let's go get outbreak you know for you like let's go oh. scale the outside wall of the tower and Things make you do like the do most like November. palm yeah. wedding <laughs> uh, kind of womp, stuff womp. um but yeah actually like you know so i i think there is there's always passion for that since you guys brought it up though uh let's talk briefly about uh vaulting and stuff like that i know we touched on the fact that it's got a, there's a chance for bungie to take the content to optimize it and then bring it back into the game like we mentioned you know uh maybe optimizing the load times maybe adding some little secrets here and there and stuff like that um ice how do you feel about one knowing that the vault is coming back uh because that, that feels like a nice big oh, glass not the content vault the oh. vault glass. <laughs> sorry okay. you're right yeah, yeah, yeah. i was I, the content my, vault. Thank you. my brain always is in the vault of glass um, I, I have to be Perk's brain translator. I'm, I'm lost. In the, <laughs> I'm lost in the corridors of time. Uh, have, you, have I told you guys about Luke Cave? No. Um, but it's uh, it's one of those things where, like, I've my personal thought on it. I want to I want to hear both of you guys your thoughts. Um, it was almost as if they were worried that the announcement that they made about Beyond Light wasn't gonna punch through enough, and they were like, "By the way, Vault of Glass." That was that's how I read it. I was popping off like at the thought of it. I mean, um, I ran down my hallway because I love Alt Glass and I love that. So, but Witch like Queen, also Lightfall, like that was the right. same announcement. Yeah, there was yeah. there was literally they were like, guys, we have so much stuff, and like I I after my excitement kind of died down, and I and I was just like, you know, I, we were going through thoughts of it. It almost feels like they were one. I think it's a great strategy, so I'll say that straight out. Like I'm not trying to speculate. Um, any um anything on Bungie's side. I think it's great and I think it's a good pacing for the cadence of 
giving their raid team more time to actually put out a bigger, better raid as opposed to having them need to put out raid layers and stuff like that. So yeah. I personally feel like it's a little bit of a good thing to have a content vault because you're going to have... In, I would rather have classic raids come back uh, and cycled through as opposed to a raid layer, something that's like so easy that it feels like a strike. So I would love to kind of hear what both of you guys think about the content vault and and just what its piece of importance is sitting inside the Beyond Light expansion and the other two expansions that we've heard about so far. I love it, to be honest. I uh, I think there's so many players that are in Destiny 2 that did not play Destiny 1, especially the start of Destiny 1 with Vault of Glass. Um, I think it's a really cool concept that it brings players like us the nostalgia that we're, we've kind of been looking for, rose-colored glasses from D1. Um, and then it allows us to bring newer players into our old experiences. And I guarantee people will story tell as they're taking new people through, like, oh, man, this crazy thing happened. Um, but but I, it's, like the de it's like the PvP maps that came from D1, that they literally just copy pasted the code <laughs> and overlaid the map into D2. Yeah. It is... It is made for D1 mechanics and movement speed. Yep. It, we talk about not, that a It's bunch. not made for D2, and it, you can feel it. So I think when they bring back this raid, they have. To, I hope they don't just lay champions in there. I hope they do a lot of other things to make it feel like you're playing it in Destiny 2, but it has nostalgia from Destiny 1. It still has the similar mechanics, same mechanics. I hope the shield is still a thing but I hope they update the shield and the mechanics to meet Destiny 2 and where it is today. Are you, you talking about the Relic? The, uh, the, the Relic like in the vault? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you, I was uh, always a Relic holder. Yeah. Always. Same. Are Loved you it. ready for Barrier Gorgons? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> hope that the Gorgons get some love because so, I, I, I thought they were such a cool part, like mm -hmm. just running past them. Uh, and that was still tricky enough, depending on who is in your fire team and how long everybody has been. Or how, what kind of, dude, uh, unstoppable. Where like they see you and just run you the fuck over. Yeah. Um, I I think. Oh, that I hope the... it has nothing to do with champions. I hope they okay. do not put champions in it at all, and I hope they just make it feel like Destiny Two without just putting champions in there. Champions are cool right. as a concept, but they are already getting old. Uh, I yeah, agree I mean, with forcing you specific so weapons. Kinda yeah. is bad, uh, especially for like raid. Like it's fine. It, it's oddly fine in strikes because there's so much variety, like week to week, and like all of those modifiers make things okay. And then we get like seasonal changes as well. So there's like different layers of rolling changes for that. But for raids, not nah, yeah. those stay different. But I do want to talk about like sort of my thoughts on on raids being vaulted worked on coming back is that it allows luke smith to bring the the world of destiny closer to the mmo he wants it to be because we all know luke loves wow um but even wow doesn't do this like you can go into ice crown citadel today in northrend and it's the same shit that you played when it launched back in the in whatever year it was um when we get our iterations of raids back there's a chance to push the story forward there's a chance to make the world seem more lived in, and we have historically always been the people pushing the stories forward because who killed uh, Riven first? Canonically, it was the world's first raid team. Mm -hmm. And that is like, well, it's not like we're going to go back in time and, and just have a world's first race again for like the same vault. We're, we're having this chance for these things to come back and just be crazier and be different and move things forward. Um, that's why I'm really pumped for Prophecy to come back too because I know that they had to change the engine and it was causing some weird shit, but like there's so much lore locked up in Prophecy that get, can also be like different like dialogue lines because all of Prophecy is about Aramis. And when it comes back uh, out of the vault, we'll already have fought Aramis I, realistically, or we'll at least be midway through that fight. So all of this prophecy is really just looking back at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so how cool would, cool would it be to just have the world of Destiny progress through vaulting and unvaulting content, constantly iterating on things like a, like a jazz standard almost, uh, so we get to have more fun in the places that we already love? Well, they have. They also have the whole 
story arc of the Vex being like their time loops, like right, they're yeah. different points in time. So they have the ability to bring these things back and weave them into the game story wise through these different time things with the Vex and the whole the whole story behind that. I'm not a huge lore guy. You can ask anyone in my chat that, but like there's an opportunity there. I uh, I kind of always thought my 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 hypothesis for if if Destiny was originally going to be a ten year game, uh, my thought was they should end Destiny the way that they began it with the Vault of Glass and have a different outcome. Um, you know, Guardians making their own fate. You know, when we kind of come through with the relic, um, with the light uh, after destroying the oracles, you come through from you know the past and present or past and future um, to slay Atheon. Uh, my thought was. Um, have it a different outcome be the case and to have that you know if they were gonna ever this is my thought if they were gonna just kind of like end the game going hey the game is over you know this is the final raid it's the first raid it's different you know maybe we go through a different way maybe we you know do something different my i, I know i'm over hyping myself then this will never happen but if we go into the vault of glass for the first time in the spring or whatever comes out and we see the npc of Pradith or kabir like inside the vault i'm probably gonna pop my probably gonna pop off just seeing them for the first time uh my thought is uh, i would love i love the classic raids and i want them all to come back king's fall is my favorite um so no one's the, the seeing oryx being a gigantic thing for the first time uh in this arena and you're looking up going whoa and you see an oryx fly around slam in his hand you see saturn yeah. in the distance like nothing gives that sort of grand um kind of uh space fantasy uh, a feel to it other than other than destiny um but i feel like for 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 vaulted raids and things that are coming back i think they tried the champion mechanic with the barrier shields and unstoppable and stuff like that i as much as i think it's a cool aspect and i think it's a part that's kind of hardwired into the game now unfortunately yeah, yeah. i i almost really would rather have enemies that do different things like I would rather sponge your enemies going back to like the world boss thing or the strike bosses that change their mechanics after you get them to a certain point uh, of health or something like that. Have yeah. them start to kind of enrage almost and, and give a, you know, an execute change mechanics, something like that. Um, I think that would, that, that's just me. I would love to see something expanded upon that. Right. I agree with you. Man. I agree with you. All right. Ice. We've been yep. through, we've been through destiny. Let's bring it back to you. We see you streaming Tarkov all the time, diversifying like a smart man. Um, how are you liking streaming outside the world of Destiny? What do you look for in a game that you're trying to diversify into? I love it. Um, when I started, I always wanted to build a community of people that just enjoyed hanging out in the stream, being with each other. Um, I always wanted to be someone in the Destiny community that was involved in the Destiny community. And I always knew I wanted to be Destiny, one of my main games. Um, but at the same time, I, I started out knowing that I was going to try to play other things. Um, Tarkov, Final Fantasy, all kinds of different challenge games like Neo, Sekiro. Um, basically, I, I've always wanted the stream to be a place where people can come, laugh, have fun, um, watch me do something challenging. What, I don't know what it is, whether it's in Destiny or another game. Um, so when I look at a game, I always want it to be something that either provides great story um looks amazing and ideally is challenging as well i'll always play a game on stream at the hardest difficulty it can possibly be um so that's that's kind of what i've always wanted my stream to be and i think we're we've been getting there um a lot of people when i rate them in their minds they don't say hey just plays destiny they say i play a lot of other stuff as well which is which has been cool so hell yeah brother i do want to like we skipped over a lot of cs there's two questions I, i'm dying to know one, what is your favorite moment from playing CS at like a competitive top level in your entire oh, career? Jeez, um, probably winning the first LAN tournament way, way back, and it was more of a local one because um, it was like the nerves were so high. Our team had been practicing like we were practicing like sixteen hours a day. Um, we even had strats down to like literal times. Like we would call strat eight. And everyone knew exactly what they would do, or if it was like 8A, 8B, and then everyone had the exact timings for flashes, smokes, stuff like that, and we'd move in. Um, That's cool. It was a lot of work, but it paid off because we won. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably say that. 
in all honesty, that but that was awesome. way back. That was like 15 years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, I think that's sick, that's though. I mean, having that kind of synchronicity, I mean, that's the stuff that you see the top teams doing now to win. Yeah. So doing that, like, that's why I got uh, coaches with those binders, man. Like yeah, gotta have it. Dude, it's it's gonna be the Belichick of CS, dude. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, final CS question: What is the biggest lesson you learned from your time playing CS competitively that you've taken forward, either into Destiny or just into like life in general? Um, honestly, hard work really, really does pay off. So, like back to that, we put in so many hours, and we did after that. But like, especially on that first tournament, we put in a ridiculous amount of hours to practice um there were lows we lost a lot um scrims we would get smashed by other teams um but you always try to take those experiences and try to learn from them incorporate it into what you're doing um and i think counter-strike really helped me learn how to play on a team how to be a leader on a team um i even like when i first started interviewing and stuff and people asked about like leadership experiences i would I took the risk and a lot of times it didn't work out. I would talk about Counter-Strike and, <laughs> and no one had any idea what the hell I was talking about. They were probably like, oh God, this guy's a nerd. But like, if I did that today, <laughs> I think it'd be different. But like 10 years ago when I was first interviewing, people were like, oh, okay. Um, Absolutely, yeah. The leadership is, it's humongous that you, what you can kind of get from, from doing it just within, in gaming. So it, it's absolutely valid. And then patience on top of it, just being patient for people, other stuff. Like just everything that goes on around you while you're trying to compete at a high level takes a shit ton of patience. So, yeah, man, that's. that's awesome. uh, I think that's a, a pretty huge takeaway for like any game, like any team game. That was like one of the biggest learn like lessons for me to learn coming from StarCraft, which was like one v one. I was always just like angry at myself, but then like it, it's very easy like going into like a league or a CS, be like to blame other people for your uh for your mistakes. So like being patient with other yeah. people also leads you to like having patience for yourself, which is really important. Um, but we've uh we've uh, gone over uh, just a little bit here. Uh, now is the time where we get to plug Iceman uh, and his, all of his streams. My friend, my buddy, what's coming up on the horizon for you and where can people find you? Um, uh, you can find me, Iceman underscore 1H on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, even Facebook. Um, yeah, pretty much all over the socials. You can find me there. Um, my Discord as well. Um, I'm always active in my Discord. I generally post updates and things in my Discord and my Twitter. Um, so those are the two of the main ones to join and hang out in. Um, what's coming? I, uh, we're going to be playing a lot of Destiny in November for sure. Um, oh, but yeah. right now we're playing Final Fantasy VII Remake, trying to finish the last God of Ramadan. I don't even know how you pronounce that thing. Um, <laughs> but it's an insane fight. We, we tried it one time today and got absolutely dumpstered by Bahamut. So we're going to go back, run it back tomorrow. Um, I'll be playing more Escape from Tarkov, Cyberpunk when that comes out. Um, but to fill the time between now and November, we'll be definitely playing more Destiny. We'll be doing more trials, comp helps, um, just all kinds of the, all kinds of that stuff. And if a game pops up that catches my interest, then we'll we'll definitely stream it. So, right on, brother. Awesome. Thank you so much oh, yeah. for uh, for joining us, man. Thanks, thanks for, for having me. This was a blast. Long, long overdue. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah honestly, definitely. when we're like, yo, let's start opening the podcast up. The first per the first name that came to mind was you. And we're glad yeah. to fucking have that happen. Oh, um, dude, I'm, it's been a blast. I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, I really likewise. do. We'll have likewise. you on again very soon. Um, so coming up on this channel, uh, I think next. Normally it would be me on on a Saturday. Uh, I'm on vacation, so either Moose or Lucas is taking over for me. So shout out to those yes. guys. Um, I think uh, is this weekend on or off for Sunday Funday? This Day? weekend is on. I think Lucas might be streaming Star Wars Squadrons oh, yeah, in yeah. your in your spot. I know we're all kind of excited for that one. Um, Sunday Funday is happening. Uh, Jared is going to be ready to go with his dual PC setup that we ordered some more parts for last <laughs> night. Uh, so both he and Harogar just are going to be doing some duos in Warzone. Nice. Um, so if you want to watch Jared yell at somebody for not uh, following their every step in Warzone. Tune in uh, <laughs> on Sunday for that. 7 Eastern as always. Um, yeah, and then Monday is back again with Lucas. I don't know if he's going to be doing squadrons then or go back to uh, comp. He is the Bob Ross of comp. Um, <laughs> yeah. He literally is just so zen all the time. 
Uh, and if he loses a match, he's like, ah, that was a that was a that was a sharp match. Um, and he literally does that. He he he's like the Bob Ross of just Zen and comp. Uh, and I then love Tuesdays, it. Tuesdays back with me again next week. Um, so yeah, Ice, thank you so so much for being on the podcast. It was great thank to you. chat with you. Uh, great conversation uh, as well. Yeah. So agreed. We'll let you wrap it up. Yes. Take us away, guys. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna raid a channel uh, shortly. Uh, I just want to call it. I think I'm gonna attempt to uh, stream. Star Wars Squadrons Night on my channel over uh, Twitch.tv slash Will Produces. We do it in VR. We'll see what kind of weird shit we can get up to tonight. Ooh. Let's get weird. Um, well, I want to get a fall counter. I'll be there because fall. I've been hearing about this game today, and I have no idea what, what it's about. So oh, I want to come check it out. If you ever played uh, X, uh, X-Wing or X-Wing yeah. versus TIE Fighter back in the day, it's like the spiritual no, yeah. success to that. It's a, oh, um, it's Microsoft so Flight Sim with lasers, and I'm going to throw my Oculus Quest on top of that, and we're going to get weird. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. so it's gonna be uh it's awesome to do that if you, if you guys are not subscribed to us on uh spotify or youtube go ahead and check out caffeines on uh on both of those places hit oh. that sub button um or apple podcasts we're on there too anywhere you can get your podcasts you'll get audio of us and we get the beautiful wind pipes of Iceman gracing us this <laughs> week Hell yeah. uh, we're gonna take it over to tylosaurus flex for, uh, mutual Bye. friend of ours um so go uh, one make last sure... thing too yeah one last thing too i meant uh i forgot to mention this i'm so sorry uh next week we're gonna be launching our website caffeines.gg Ooh. Uh, so i forgot to talk about that uh we're gonna be launching the new website it's gonna have a lot of stuff we're gonna be kind of doing some blog posts some kind of a little bit of a longer thought piece i know twitter is kind of the water cooler of the internet where you kind of have short conversations we talk so much about stuff. We wanted to kind of get into writing a little bit more articles and stuff. We're going to be doing some uh, PVE guides as well. It's possibly reviewing some weapons and actually doing some write-ups on some tech that we all kind of like to use with everybody kind of being more PC oriented. There's so much stuff um, to do. So check us out. Caffeine.gg will be sure to tweet uh, once that whole thing goes live as well. But let's take it over to Ty. I'm sorry to interrupt. I wanted no, to throw that okay. in there really good. It's okay. We, uh, we also... I can't believe we forgot Moose. Moose is the most important Moose on Wednesday. Uh Wednesday streamer in our lives at least. <laughs> um Crucible with the Mooseable. I don't know what she's been streaming. She's been streaming ESO lately, uh which is great. Um but do not miss Moose on Wednesdays. Now we're taking the raid over and I'm going to count us down. Let's 10, do 9, 8. Tell the caffeine send you guys sent you guys over in 5, 4, Seven, 3, 2, six, eight. 1 and Raid now. And awesome.